everybody, great news. Guess what? My book, Wimpy Week and Woke, is finally available on Amazon. If you want the physical copy, it looks just like this. They do have the Kindle version of Amazon. It's finally available. Go on Amazon uh, and get this stinking book. Get it for somebody because I'll tell you what, it's an election year. People are uber confused. Uh, we're getting such incredibly terrible advice from so many corners, not just of the internet in general, not just from the secular world, but from, honestly, Big Eva. That's just the way it is. I'm sorry, not sorry. You need to go check it out so we understand what is going on. All right, so go check it out. It's finally available, and I'm excited about it. What are we talking about today? So we have pro-lifers arrested um, facing more than 10 years in jail. We're gonna, it's, it, what's happening in our country is so absolutely insane. And I don't even, like, I really don't even want to talk about politics except that some of our Christian leaders, some of them, are saying such terrible, insidious harmful, dangerous, ridiculous things that we have to cover it right here on Cooper's Up. We are in a very dangerous time. So we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about things like this, arbitrary law. We're talking about tyranny, totalitarianism, uh, the law of God. And I'm going to talk about this. Um, these pro-lifers. I'm talking about the fact that we have so much violence happening. We have an immigration crisis right now. Um, our law and order stuff is so very confused. Get, but guess what? In the church, we're also confused about the moral law of God. Is that still, is that relevant in any way, shape, or form? We're going to talk about a ton of things. It's going to be jam-packed, but it's going to be good. I'm a little worked up. I am a little worked up today, so you're going to want to stick with us right here on Cooper Stuff. Welcome back to Cooper Stuff. I hope everybody is doing good. Here's my weekly reminder. Politics cannot save America. Only the gospel of Christ can save America. And I tell you what, even if you get everything you want in a politician, even if the whole place becomes just like what you want, if, if there is not a change in our hearts towards the moral law of God, we are, just, we are not, it's going to go bad. We're messed up. That's just the way it is, because right now that we have a ton of Christless conservatism, I think is an okay way to call it that, even if it, it, it helps slow down the process of how bad things are going in America, if we don't have a change in, in our hearts towards the moral law of God, we, we have a moral rot that is so deep, things are going to get really bad. And so we're, I have so much to talk about. I don't know if I can get to it, but I am worked up. I don't want to talk about politics. The things I am seeing our Christian leaders say uh, on the big Eva level, on the platform level, the institutional leaders, I want to say again, I'm not talking about those thousands and thousands, maybe tens of thousands, I don't know, of faithful ministers who are doing the work of the gospel week after week after week. I'm not talking about those people. Praise the Lord for those people. If you go to a church like that, you need to say thank you to your leaders. You, you have to. It is a thankless job, and they don't get they don't get those woke cookies from the world. Of course, they don't want those woke cookies from the world. They don't want virtue points. They want treasures in heaven. That's what they want. They don't want treasures of the world. They don't need it. But still, t tell them thank you. Thank you for being faithful ministers. There's tons and tons of them. I ain't talking about them. I want to read you some. I got this great old book called Christian Economics by a guy called, I think his name is John Richardson. Is that his name? Um John Richardson, I think he was a pastor. Um, in, in the beginning, this is how uh, like you, uh, this is how old it is. It's got like the library stamps and whatnot from uh, Westminster Presbyterian Church, in Atlanta, Georgia. This is written, you guys, in 1968, I believe. So um, I, I want to read you this. This book was like a real treasure. Um, I, I found it because I was reading somebody else. I don't remember who I was reading, um, who, and they said, yeah, Christian economics. There's not like a lot of these kind of books. This book was a treasure. I loved it. So the last chapter, chapter 14, is called How to Conserve a Nation. Listen to this. What brings a nation to the grave? The answer is not hard to locate. Three things are quite apparent and come instantly to mind. Sorry, I guess to turn the pages in this old book here. 
Or you see what he's saying? There are three things that come to mind. Here you go. Th- these are these are three different things that could cause um, the nation to, to collapse. Number one, corruption of moral character. Hello, amen. When pleasure becomes the chief aim of a people, the undertaker is close at hand. True. Two, skepticism or a state of not knowing and not caring. People cannot make progress, nor can they even maintain their present position when they live in a state of indifference or uncertainty about ultimate issues. I, I want to say this. We're talking about skepticism, but listen to that. Let's say it again. When they live in a state of indifference or uncertainty about ultimate issues. This is going to be directly related to the pro-life thing I said earlier. So it's it's indifference towards ultimate issues or it's uncertainty like is is that okay is it okay to take the life of innocent children in the womb or is it not okay is it okay to mutilate children under under banners of of gender justice or is that not okay is it okay to steal from some people and give to other people in wealth redistribution is it okay for the state to infringe upon individuals rights or is that not okay you know it's like individualism versus collectivism what he's talking about is incredible moral relativism and the arbitrary will of the people or the arbitrary will of the state or the arbitrary moral um, character of the people in charge. That's a pretty big deal. So he's saying, number one, it, it could be from the corruption of moral character. That will end a society. Number two, could be from skepticism, a state of indifference or uncertainty about ultimate issues, moral rel- relativism. Or number three, The deification of the state, which might be paraphrased as, I believe in the state almighty. There is little difference between emperor worship and the absolutizing of a democratic rule or majority rule. They are both forms of idolatry ascribing to man the majesty and authority that belongs to God alone. So let's say when he says the deification of the state, that means this state is God. What is the ultimate authority? The state. That's what communism does. Socialism, various forms of collectivism. We absolutize the state. It is God. There is nothing above it. So, so, so in America, of course, we we have a, a republic, but it is a republic that recognizes God-given rights. It recognizes a supreme ruler. Sometimes in in, in the documents of the Constitution, things you see these these phrases like. Um, the God of nature or of nature and nature's God. So it's referring to several different things, which we're not going to get into. But the idea being there is a supreme ruler above this who is who has created the world in such a way that it has limited the power of the state. The state does not have absolute control to do anything and everything it wants to. The Bible is full of, of, of this kind of information saying that the state will try to usurp the authority of God. So when we talk about this kind of, that's, that, I mean, yes, it's a political conversation, but that is not like political partisanship. That is not stumping for the GOP or the DNC for that matter. That's not stumping for a particular candidate. That is, that is political philosophy, but I would argue it's actually biblical theology, giving you an idea that the state is endowed with certain powers by God. So the state is underneath the Lord Jesus Christ. The state has this much authority and that much authority alone, and it may not step out of that. And if it does, it becomes its own God. So this guy, I can't remember his name already. What's his name? Richardson is saying, here's the things that can end a nation. Number one, corruption of moral character. We have that in spades, right? We have that in spades. That's us. Number two, another thing that could destroy a nation, skepticism, if you live in a state of indifference towards ultimate issues or uncertainty about ultimate issues, I already explained that. I'm I'm indifferent to slavery. Well, that can end a nation. I'm indifferent to abortion. I'm indifferent to these massive moral issues. I'm either indifferent or else I'm, I'm so confused about I'm just uncertain about what is right and wrong about ultimate issues, murder, things like that. Well, I'd say we have that. We're going to talk about that a little bit later when we show this abortion, this pro-lifer clip. I think that we're kind of living in a time when I'd say we're pretty uncertain or and or indifferent towards them. So guess what? We also we have so far we have two out of three. Number three, the deification of the state, which might be paraphrased as I believe in the state almighty. Um, do we have that in this country? Yes, 
we got that in our country. We have all three. He's saying these are these things kind of come to mind as things that can end a civilization. It could be one, two, or three. All these things can do it. We have all three. We are on the precipice of the end of Western civilization. We are on the precipice of the end of the greatest experiment in freedom the world has ever seen. And guess what? That freedom was built on, uh, uh, the, the foundations were built on an understanding of the Bible. It didn't come from some secular idea of, of human rights and some secular idea of utopia, some secular idea of we got to make things better. No, no. Individual rights came from the Bible. So uh, th- this, is, this is what we're getting into. The, this is why I always say, I said it in my book, Wimpy, Weak, and Woke. These, this war against Western civilization is at its heart a war against Christianity. This is where all this confusion with Christian nationalism stuff. We're, we're gonna, I got so much to get into. We're on the precipice of a state of totalitarianism. Now, this is the irony, is that the Christian left keeps saying it's the Christian right. They've become authoritarian, and, and they're idolatrous towards political stuff. and this and the other. I don't want to talk about this stuff, but these Christian leaders keep making me do it. This is the irony of the whole situation, is they're bringing these, these false equivalencies. And i got to tell you guys, I think it's insidious, so here we go. We're going to make some people mad. Let's go ahead and get this going. I'm not trying to make people mad, but if we want to make news, I guess we're going to make it. If I was the devil, if I was the enemy of God, the enemy of people, because the devil hates people, right? The devil, he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. That's all he wants to do is to destroy humankind. And if he can keep you in deception... Number one, in deception to the knowledge of God, that Jesus is the Christ, he died and rose from the dead, and he offers salvation for those who give their hearts to him, those who repent and are born again through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He doesn't want you to know that. He wants you to stay in shackles to sin. But he also just wants your life to be terrible. I mean, that's the number one thing. But if you are a Christian, well, the devil is still kind of made a little bit happy as long as he can render you ineffective for the gospel. And if he can render you still as if you are acting as if you are still a slave to sin, as long as you don't glorify God, he gets a little bit of pleasure of that. He wants your life to be bad. So if I was the devil, what I would want to do with these Christian leaders, I would want to create a false equivalency in politics between this idea that, well, Jesus isn't right or left, and all, and they're, they're, these are equal evils, these are equal. I would want to create that sort of false equivalency. You've heard me say on the show, I don't like the whole thing of, you can't, if you're a Christian, you can't possibly vote Democrat. I don't like that kind of stuff. I don't know what God's doing in somebody's hearts. I don't know where they're at in their process of sanctification. I don't know who's saved and who isn't saved. That belongs to the Lord. That's his knowledge, not mine. But I w- if I was the devil, I would want to create... A false equivalency that says some of the things that these big Eva folks are saying. I would want to say something like, well, they're both wrong. The right and the left are wrong. And this idolatrous on either way. We are on the precipice of the destruction of Western civilization. And these big Eva leaders, they will not say, they will never say anything bad against the left, ever. They always say bad stuff against the right. The question is this, is, is it actually equivalent Who is it that is promoting the deification of the state? As I just read from this book from Richardson. Who's promoting the the deification of the state? Is that that the right or is that the left? Now, they always want to say, well, the right's making an idol of Trump. Hey, maybe some people are. I've told you, I don't don't like that. I don't want to go to church and I don't want to have a, 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 you know, a, a picture of Jesus on the cross and Jesus is wearing a MAGA hat. Don't like it. I agree. Idolatrous. Not my thing. Don't like it. All right. Don't like it. I don't want them coming in and stumping for particular candidates. I don't think that's a really good idea. But we have to talk about political philosophy. We have to talk about the moral law of God. Do we not? So who is doing the deification of the state? Somebody may say, well, they think Trump's going to be the savior. Here's the difference. It is it is leftist utopianist who are moving for the deification of the state. That means that the state is the Messiah. The state is who is going to save us. Now, some of these people say, well, they, some of the people on the right think that Trump is going to save us. Okay, fine. 
The question is this, is what do they think Trump's going to, quote, save us to? How is he going to save us? So I, I don't like that language. I don't like the language of Trump is going to save us from all evil. I don't think that's true. But the question is this, is if he did, if you got, if you voted for Trump or whoever's the GOP candidate, conservatism, and you got everything you wanted, what does them saving us look like? Do you see where I'm, I hope you see where I'm going for this. Let me give you an idea. What them saving us would look like, and I've already said, I don't like the language. Trump is not a savior. Trump is not a prophet or DeSantis or whoever it is that you wanted to win that's not going to win because Trump's skunking everybody. But put whoever you want in there, hypothetically. What does them saving us look like? Well, what them saving us looks like is actually... I'm talking about a best-case scenario. I'm, I'm also not stumping for DeSantis, Trump. I'm not stumping for anybody. I'm saying if you had everything you wanted in a conservative politician and it actually worked and it, quote, saved us, what would it look like? Well, it would look like going back to what the founders wanted for this country, limited government that gets out of my business. Get out of my business. Get the Duke out of here. You don't need to be involved in my children's education. You don't need to be involved in what my church is teaching me about Jesus. You don't need to try to silence me in the public square because I talked about religion because there's some, you know, quote unquote, wall of separation between church and state. You need to, to deregulate business. You, you, we don't need you involved in our business, literally in our business, meaning our business enterprises. We have the, the, the free market capitalism. We will let competition do its work. We don't need you involved. In other words, it's deregulation. It is putting government, federal government back into its limits where it was supposed to be. It promotes individualism. It promotes individualism over collectivism. It promotes a good form of nationalism versus globalism. It, it promotes individual liberties over the quote-unquote um, deification of the common good or the making the, quote, common good the most authoritative thing that there is. You know what I mean when I say common good? In other words, yes, we're going to step on your individual rights, but it's just better for everybody. I know it's hard to think of a time that could be like that, but imagine there was a pandemic. Hello, imagine there was a pandemic and we had to pull out all of the experts and all the quote experts came out and they said, well, we know what's better for you than you do because you're too dumb to make a decision. We're going to shut your church down. We're going to force you to take a jab. And I know you've read the information on the jab, but you're too dumb to understand it. We know it's better for you and for the common good. We're going to force you to do this. That's what it looks like. So. If people say, well, Trump's the savior, I don't think Trump's the savior, but let's just say hypothetically, if they were to get what they wanted, him saving us would look like government shrinking. It would look like paying down the country's debt. It would look like shrinking the welfare state, shrinking entitlement programs. It would look like, yes, controlling the border, not because we hate people that come from other countries, but because you cannot keep doing what it's doing. It is going to blow the world apart, and we have to create, to make, literally make, when I mean print money, money becomes worthless because you have to print so much more of it in order to give entitlements to millions of people coming over the border. That's just, that's what it is. So if they were going to save us, it would not be the deification of the state. So this is a false equivalence. What is happening on the left is the deification of the state, the state to become the supreme ruler, the state to become the parent, the state to pay my bills, the state to pay bills of people who don't even live here, for the state to open up all the borders and bring in everybody from the whole world into here because we're going to enforce Equity of outcome on everybody, which can only happen by making everybody's lives worse. Taking money from some people, giving from other. And by the way, taking money from some people to give it for somebody else is a form of robbery. If that is, if you care about the moral law of God, if the moral law of God has anything to say about anything anymore. And if you ask Big Eva, they probably say not really, unless it's about racism. They'd find a way to make that one work. But that's it. They'll do it for leftist causes. So we are bringing a false equivalency in. It is not the same to say that, that, well, both the left and the right are being idolatrous. That's not the same thing. Only one is, is seeing the deification of the state. Right now, the movement on the right is actually to shrink the government. Whew, I get worked up about this because it's just so absolutely crazy. Now, I've got to move to my next thing. Understand this. You have to understand the way. 
when I started reading communist literature to write my book, I began to understand so much more about the way dictators work. Stalin, Lenin, you see these communist regimes come in. This is the way dictators work. They work on the arbitrary will, the arbitrary will of the dictator or the state or the quote-unquote group of experts, which is where we're moving to in the West right now if we do not put a stop to this. And these Christian leaders, I'm telling you, if I was the devil— now, listen, I'm not saying they're not Christians. I'm not saying they're not brothers in Christ. I'm not saying the devil's using them and they're the devil's pawns. You make up your own mind. If I was the devil, I would be super duper happy that these Christian leaders were not warning us at all about the deification of the state and about the arbitrary will of the, quote, experts, of the arbitrary will of the state or of the dictators or to try to to infringe upon your individual liberties in order to make the state more responsible for your life and everybody else's life and to take your liberties away. If I was the devil, I would be so stinking happy that these Christian leaders were spouting this stuff. It is insidious. It is insidious. I'm not saying they're doing the work of the devil. You make up your own mind. If I was the devil, I'd be like, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much for doing this. You're making my life easy. I'm going to show you a couple clips later. You can, you, you can tell me if you, I don't, you, you make your own decisions. I think you're smart enough to make a decision on your own. I'll tell you what. The arbitrary will of the dictators, here's what they do in communist countries. Rather than setting laws, a law based in static morality. If you don't know what I mean when I say static morality, what I mean is a law that is fixed. The moral law of God in the Bible is is forever because the moral law in the Bible, the Ten Commandments, let's say, that is rooted in the character of God. So the moral law can't change because God doesn't change. You, You understand? Like the character of God then is seen in the laws that he is saying are supposed to govern you, not just Christians, not just his people. These are laws that that are that govern every single human being that's ever lived. They're not arbitrary. They're based on his own character. So when we create government law, I know the Christians aren't supposed to get political. Every law is political. Where do you think laws come from, man? Every law has to be rooted in something. So what we want to do is create law that is not arbitrary. The, uh, like imagine coming home. And your dad says, I don't want you wearing blue anymore. Why? Because I said so. Well, th- that seems kind of arbitrary. It'd be better to understand why we're not allowed to wear blue. What- what's the deal with that? Where does that come from? God's laws are not arbitrary. I wrote about this in my book. you got to go get my book and see. God's laws are not arbitrary. He's not like, well, I want you to keep the Sabbath holy. Why? Because I said so. No, there's reasons for this. And there are reasons also for your own benefit, for your own blessing. So not just reasons rooted in his character, you see, which is true. But there are also rules that when we obey them that we are actually blessed. Well, what dictators want to do is say, we're not going to have laws rooted in any fixed principles. We're going to have arbitrary law. Why? So I can control you, dummy. It's because I'm a commie. Because I want you to, to live in absolute fear. And so what do I do? Well, today I say, everyone's got to be off the street by 6 o'clock. And then the next day, what happens at 5 o'clock? We start arresting people on the streets, and you have nobody to appeal to. You th- I thought it, it wasn't until 6 o'clock. You never said, well, yeah, we changed it. It's 5 now. You're going to the gulags. Why? Because we're in control. Because we're doing what's better. And then they try to mind control you to think that you're actually wrong. And it was always 5 o'clock. You, that's where they, it was always 5 o'clock. It's arbitrary rule. Because they want you to live in fear and they keep changing the rules every single this is what communists communists did over and over. They just keep changing the rules so that they can keep you living in fear. Also, so that you have no one to appeal to. It's not about individual rights, it's about the collective. We decide what's good for you. Well, that's not how the moral law of God works. Okay, law actually matters. And this is woven in to where I think Big Eva P folks are getting this stuff so wrong. They're getting it so stinking wrong. They're constantly talking about Christian nationalism. They're constantly beating up on the right. They're constantly saying, you got to quit doing that and keep it about the gospel. I read an incredible quote that I, that I, I want to read to you. Um, and 
it's attributed to a Puritan, even though it doesn't say who that Puritan is, um, which is funny. He's like, because the guy says, it's a quote from a Puritan, but I can't remember who. But listen to this. You ready? It's pure. It's old, so it's going to have weird language. It is of no use trying to sew with the silken thread of the gospel unless we pierce away for it with the sharp needle of the law. You see what I'm saying? In other words, yes, we've got to keep it all about the gospel. But when you're telling somebody about the gospel, which is good news, good news, Jesus died and he took the penalty for your sin. Well, what is sin? You see, what, what do you mean sin? The good news, God is going to forgive you for all of your evil. What evil? What have I done that's evil? It is the law of God that teaches us what evil actually is. So this idea from the, from these people and Big Eva claiming that they're not right or left. They're just, they're just apolitical. They're in the middle. It's nefarious. It is subversive. They are not in the middle. Have you ever heard them go off on the Christian left? No. They constantly break the Christian right. Constantly. It's subversive. They are just leftists. Now, some people say they're being hypocritical because they keep saying that they're apolitical, but they never yell. That they're not being hypocritical because they are leftists. They are being subversive. They believe in leftist politics. That's the way it goes. They always say, you got to keep it about the gospel. <coughs> but the truth is this. You can't preach the gospel without preaching sin. That's what this quote is saying. You can't sew with the needle of grace and, and this, what do you call it, the silken thread of grace. The beautiful wonder of the good news of Jesus Christ. He died, he rose, and his grace is free. Unmerited favor. The grace of God will set you free. It is such good news. But the bad news is that you need to be forgiven because the law of God says you are guilty. So you can't just preach the gospel without first explaining what the law of God is. That's what the book, book of Romans teaches. Paul says in Romans, I wouldn't have known what sin was except that his law tells me so. The law is a task a, a schoolmaster. It's a schoolmaster to teach you this is what you did and it's wrong. Why is it wrong? Because the law of God is rooted in the character of God and God decides what is righteous and what is wicked. So when it comes down to politics, this idea that we can be apolitical and never, ever, ever say anything about morality to the culture or you're being too political is absolutely asinine. And these people are smart. They know what they're saying is not true. They're not being hypocrites. They're just being leftist. I told you there's a film. Now we're getting into what we're talking about. I'll read this abortion stuff. Um the pro choice the pro excuse me the pro lifers i'm going to read this story but but first i got to give you a couple of clips you have to see there's a film coming out this month i told you it is called uh faith and what is it called god and country god and country rob reiner made it rob reiner is an atheist leftist he's making it to say the biggest threat in America is this Christian nationalism. It is authoritarian. They're mixing church and state. And, they, and they, they are all, they're all like MAGA people. And they have all these people like Phil Vischer from the Unholy Post podcast. Sky Jathani is, is he's not in it. I don't know if he's in it or not, but he's, he's been praising it. Talking about this big deal. David French, um, Russell Moore. Russell Moore, who is, is the editor of Christianity Today. He was the president of the ERLC, which was the Social Justice Religious Liberties Committee for, of, uh, wing of the SBC, the Southern Baptist Church, the biggest denomination in the world, all right? These people are just, they're just leftist. That's all I can say. And they're constantly berating about Christian nationalism on the right. I want First, I want you to watch this clip. This is a guy called William Barber. His sermon, first, it's going to be hard for you to understand what he's saying because he's screaming and it's poor quality. He's a preacher, okay? I want you to listen to this clip. He's saying, we got to go to the ballot booth. We got to go to the ballot booth. We need the biggest showing we ever had at the ballot booth. And when we get these people in, they're not going to turn their backs on us like they have before. He's saying, of course, you need to go and vote for Biden. Uh, this is a few a couple of years ago. You'll see it because everybody's got their COVID mask on and their like LGBT pride flag themed mask. He's saying you got to go vote for the Democrats. We have to make the biggest voting we've ever shown. And when they get in there, they're going to have to make abortion legal and federal law in the whole country. They got to get in there, and they do that. I want you to listen to this, and and you tell me. I, 
Do you tell me if you've heard a lot of people on the Christian, quote unquote, the Christian right, preach this blatantly about going and voting? Uh, check out this clip. From, this is a guy called William Barber. Here we go. We need everybody to get a ballot, fill out a ballot, cast a ballot. We must have the most moral, massive, progressive vote out turnout ever in the history of the United States. Okay, so that guy, Pastor William Barber, the guy right there, he is also the guy at the end of the clip for the for the um, movie trailer for God and Country, which, as I told you, got tons of Christian leaders in it, tons of Big Eva, Russell Moore, one of the most influential uh, evangelical leaders of our time, um, who is uh, you know super super good friends with uh, Tim Keller. That, that group was all in the same group, all right? So you have the whole, like, we can't be right and left. That was the Tim Keller thing. We have to create the third way. They were all in that. And now you've got Russell Moore, David French, and all these people. I want So William Barber, the guy just screaming about going and voting, is in the, the, the trailer for God and Country saying that this Christian, there's got to be a separation of church and state, and we shouldn't be getting political. This is the same guy. Watch him at the end of this trailer go. Christianity at its best is committed to love and truth and justice. If we do this right, what a country we will be. That's the same guy. And the Christian nationalist saying, saying the biggest expression is love and love. It. The same guy saying that we have to, to make abortion the law of the land. So when these people come on and talk about things like love and justice, just not justice for the unborn, not, right, not, not justice for 800,000 babies being killed a year, not justice for those folks. No, 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 no. The guy coming and saying, we have to do this, we have to have this separation of church and state, it's idolatrous, it's Christian nationalism, is the same guy preaching in his pulpit, I, I would say the most um, passionate plea to go vote for a candidate I've ever heard. Am, am I saying that nobody does that on the right? I'm sure there are. I've already told you there are some what I would consider to be idolatrous uh, uh, preachers on the right, right? They go in there and they've got a picture of Jesus and a picture of, of Donald Trump. I know there are people like that. I just don't think there's that many. I reject it. I don't think it's good. I don't think it's good. I've already said it. Well, this guy is the left version of that. And he is being um, uh, uh, one of the main people in this film coming out alongside people like Russell Moore and David French and people that are saying it's the, it's the Christian right that is politically idolatrous in this country, not doing love, not doing justice. Well, what is justice to these people? I want you to watch another clip. This is from a guy called Preston Sprinkle. Preston Sprinkle, I would say, is the number one go-to guy uh, in, in Christianity, in the evangelical world, and I'm talking about in Orthodox Christianity. If you go to a major, what I would call mainstream church, it probably is the case that your church uses Preston Sprinkle's materials. He, he is the head of the Center for Biblical Faith, Gender, Sexuality, or something like that. I always forget the names. Last name's Sprinkle. Go look him up. Um, he is the go-to guy for these things. And I'm here to tell you, from personal experience, if you say anything negative about Preston Sprinkle, you will get beat down by the evangelical world. I will get beat down. I'll have people on this episode mad at me for bringing up Preston Sprinkle. If you go to your church leaders and say, hey, I see that we're using Preston Sprinkle stuff when it comes to sexuality and gender, and I've got some concerns about Preston Sprinkle, they will get upset with you. I know it from personal experience uh, from my own, some of my own leaders. They do not want you saying anything negative about Preston Sprinkle. I do not know why. He is viewed as the go-to guy He's orthodox. He's the man. Do not touch it. I want you to watch 
this clip that he just released recently. He has this whole big thing he does called Exiles in Babylon is this big thing. And, of course, he's always saying, we're not supposed to be right and left, and it's the, the Christian right is just politically idolatrous. He never says that about the political left. It's always about the political right. Let's watch this clip that just came up this week. A friend of mine told me a story about inviting her neighbor to church one Sunday, and her neighbor said yes and was excited to visit. But she ended up getting sick at the last minute and couldn't make it. My friend was disappointed at first, but after hearing the sermon that Sunday, she was actually thankful that her unsaved neighbor wasn't there. You see, it turns out that her neighbor was a Democrat. And that Sunday, the pastor preached a sermon that was more about right-wing politics than about Jesus. And if her neighbor had actually been there, she wouldn't have heard that she was a sinner in need of Jesus, but a Democrat in need of becoming Republican. Can you imagine this happening in the first century church? Can you imagine a non-believer from the Roman Empire walking into a gathering of Christians and feeling like they couldn't follow Jesus unless they supported a particular Roman emperor? Can you imagine Jewish exiles dividing over which Babylonian ruler they like the best? It is embarrassing that modern Christians and churches are dividing over which current Babylonian leader they prefer. One of the greatest challenges facing the church today is political idolatry, thinking we can give our allegiance to a political party and that this won't dilute our allegiance to King Jesus. We are exiles in Babylon. An identity of the cross is fundamentally at odds with an identity of empire and to confess Jesus as Lord, well, this means Caesar is not. We have no king but Christ. I could do an entire episode just on that clip alone. Why am I showing you that clip? What I, I'm, I've already said for the third time, are there people on the— I wasn't at this church service he's talking about. I do not believe—I do not believe what Sprinkle is hinting at. I think this is not true. I think it's deceptive. And am I saying that he's a deceiver, a liar, a pawn of Satan? Not saying that. I think this is insidious. I do not believe him. He's making it sound like they went to this church and they were going to hear about Jesus, but instead a guy came out with a MAGA hat on and started saying, if you want to be a true follower of Jesus, then you've got to be a conservative Republican and you've got to go vote for Trump. That's what it sounds like he's hinting at. More than likely, what happened was that this person went into a church and in that church they were preaching about quote-unquote right-wing stuff like that abortion is evil. That's my guess. Or that God has a certain plan for sexuality and gender. And it is being challenged. And as I read from the book that I read for you earlier, from Christian Economics, from this guy, John Richardson, or whatever his name's called, Richardson, which was amazing, the first thing that can end an entire civilization is d- decline in morality. It is the confusion of, what, of men and women. What is a man? What is a woman? What is marriage? What is... What is God's plan for sexuality and what does God say is not his plan for sexuality? And yes, once you go down that path, you will disintegrate and dissemble the entire community and the entire nation could fall, yes, because of a praise and celebration of sexual immorality. My guess is that's probably what was happening in that church. Now, some of you go, well, John, you're taking a lot of whatever. Well, let me ask you this. Has has Preston Sprinkle ever made a video saying, hey, this guy went into a church and he's a Republican, you know, uh, cowboy, tr- truck driving, you know, MAGA guy. Well, he went into church and they, he could have heard about Jesus want to save him. But instead, it was Pastor William Barber screaming about going and voting for Biden to make sure they could legalize abortion. And that's politically idolatrous. I've never seen Preston Sprinkle do a video like that. I've never heard him do a video saying the left in this country needs to watch out the deification of the state to make the state responsible for your kid's education, to make the state responsible for there not being any borders in this country, to try to erase American history, to try to judge people on the color of their skin as a as a member of a group rather than as an individual, the, that's the political deification of the state, and it is evil. I've never seen Preston Sprinkle do that. I'm going to read from you from Preston Sprinkle's book, People to be Loved, which I have in my hand. This is the amazing thing. All these churches and all these pastors that want to defend Preston Sprinkle, they want to defend him because he sounds nice, and he has a good tone, and he shows love towards people wrestling with whatever, same-sex attraction or, or um, acts. Um, uh, same-sex 
um, sexual acts or or transgenderism or whatever. He has a great tone and he is loving towards these people, which I affirm. I think it's wonderful to have a great tone towards people who are struggling with sin. Uh, duh, yes, you should. Um, but because of that, they love and, and and he always in the end, he'll land on theologically an or a pretty orthodox position where he'll say, I don't think the Bible affirms um, same sex marriage. So hey, I love that he says it. But then in his practice, he puts so many caveats that in the end, he wants us to act as if we don't believe that. So I'm just going to read you from his book. Here we go. You ready? He says, our affirming Christians heretics, affirming means people who affirm um, same-sex behavior. So that they call that affirming and non-affirming. We haven't talked about this a lot on the show, but affirming means, hey, if I say, hey, are you an affirming Christian? What they mean is, is do you think that you can be gay and Christian? That's basically what they're saying. Can you, can you live... Uh, and then he, he wouldn't even like the gay and Christian thing. So maybe a better way to say it is, can you actively live a gay life and also be a Christian in good standing before God? That's what, that's what they mean by affirming, okay? So, are affirming Christian heretics, wolves in sheep's clothing, false prophets, or is this a secondary issue that believers can disagree on, like keeping the Sabbath and baptism and still join hands in worship? Does it come down to simple disagreement on how to interpret a few passages, or is it a gospel issue that is a threat to orthodoxy? Do you understand what he's asking? He's saying, hey, this is a question worth asking. Like, I've got great brothers in Christ. We don't agree on baptism. I believe in believer's baptism. A lot of Reformed people do pedo baptism and, and they make fun of me for believing in, in believer's baptism, which is more of a Baptist um, or even Reformed Baptist position. Um, in the end, I know what they believe. I get where they're coming from. They know what I believe. They get where I'm coming from. Um, the pedo Baptists love making fun of people like me, but it's all in good fun. Or, or it's we're brothers in Christ. We are not going to say no. We can't worship God together because of this. Whatever. Now, if you wanted to say something like, um, can we have different positions on slavery and still break bread together? Well, now you're getting into ethical issues that is an entirely different issue. What he's saying is, is okay, is this one of those issues or is this kind of like keeping the Sabbath? Some people think you should keep the Sabbath and don't go to work and don't drive your car and don't do electronic stuff. Other people say, hey, that's not a thing for me. And he's saying, which one is it? And this is what Preston Sprinkle says. I don't think I can chisel my answer in stone just yet. I'm still working through all the implications of my ongoing study. And I'm sure I will be thinking through this question for many years to come. Preston Sprinkle is saying, oh, I'm completely orthodox on this. I don't believe the Bible sanctions same-sex marriage, but I've got years and years and years of study ahead of me. I mean, ongoing study. It's going to take me, it might take decades before I can really ever come to the conclusion of my studies. Because of that, I don't want to answer whether we should separate over this or not. Well, what do you think that that means, you guys? Can you read between the lines? Do you have eyes to see? Do you have spiritual eyes to see where this is going? Where this is going is that anybody says, oh, actually, in my church, I do think that's something we divide about. That is a, it's an ethical issue, uh, issue of holiness, sanctification, um, and the moral law of God that is so clear in the Bible. Uh, I, 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 that's an issue we have to divide on. Well, guess what happens when you do that? You're becoming politically idolatrous. If you don't believe me, go get the book. It's called People to be Loved, and if you just have a little bit of eyes to see, you'll be able to see it. Let's, I'll read another passage. If you want to look it up, page 178. He's talking about churches. How are we going to deal with churches? He says, one of the ways to cultivate such an environment is to avoid, listen to this, offhand comments about, quote, the gay agenda, the homosexual community, or the sin of homosexuality. All of these phrases and many others often get misconstrued and misinterpreted, especially by the 13-year-old who is scrambling to find a gun because he thinks he is an abomination before God. If you are a preacher, use your words carefully. Explain what you mean and what you don't mean. Don't sling out phrases that could mean different things to many different people. Personally, I don't normally mention homosexuality from the pulpit unless I carefully explain exactly what I mean. I don't use homosexuality as a, as a quick example of sin, and I don't talk about culture wars from the pulpit. Do you see what he just said? He just made a seamless transition from talking about sexuality from the pulpit and culture wars. So when I hear Preston Sprinkle say this, I don't think that I'm going on, on a limb saying, 
I doubt this person walked into a church and a guy came out with a MAGA hat and a Trump thing saying, we got to vote for him. It's going to be the best thing ever. Beautiful. Do I think that's really what happened? No. I think probably they came out and preached from the word of God. This is why this is so insidious. What these big Eva folks are saying is that there's some things in the Bible you just shouldn't preach from the pulpit. Are you comfortable with that? Honestly, I don't even want to talk about politics. Th- these guys are making me because this is so, ap- this is insane. There's stuff in the Bible you really just shouldn't say. Why? Because it's going to cause everybody to go kill themselves. This is absolutely insidious. So if I'm the devil, if I'm in the army of darkness and I want to keep people enslaved into sin, if I want them to to not understand the freedom of Christ, I'm pretty happy about people like these big evil leaders going around saying they made a seamless transition, by the way, from the whole critical race theory, social justice, racism to Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism is the new social justice. That it's like the new CRT. Seamless transition to beat up on people on the right, to never beat up on people on the left, and to equivocate them as if they are both the same thing. At the same time, they are not preaching what they should be preaching, which is this. Freedom as we understand it in America is a God-given gift. If that makes me sound right-wing, then so be it. That's, that's absurd. It is a God-given gift. Without the Bible, there is no liberty. Without the Bible, there is no freedom. There is no individual rights. There is no individual liberties. There is no limiting of the government to their particular sphere because I should have some sort of autonomy. I should have government over my kids, not not the state. That doesn't exist without the Bible. The Bible and American freedom are, are very, very tightly linked. I should say the Bible and freedom in general. Let's not say American freedom because some people start saying, oh, that makes it sound Christian nationalism. The freedoms as we understand it comes from the Bible. They should be preaching that. But instead, they are acting like you're being idolatrous if you say it, which means, in my opinion, these leaders are supporting tyranny, they are, they, are, they are being useful idiots for totalitarian regimes that want to crush what we now call America. They are crushing it from immigration. They are crushing it by printing money. They are crushing it by theft, stealing money from some people to give it to other people, creating incentives for people to come here who have nothing to take money from American people to give it to people who come here with nothing. You cannot have a country without borders. This is not about some sort of we hate people that don't look like us or speak our language. That's stupid. Nobody, very few people believe that. So they're supporting totalitarianism with all of these various things. It is robustly evil. What will it lead to? It will lead to terrible outcomes for everybody, not just Christian people, terrible outcomes for everybody. Why? Because now what you're dealing with, we're going back to what I started at the beginning. I know this is a long episode. Stay with me. I'm almost done. You're going back to the arbitrary will of the state or the arbitrary will of the lawmakers or the experts or the dictator. You're not any longer dealing with moral absolutes that we should put into law to glorify the creator and to live in the blessing thereof. This is where we get to the pro-lifers. I'll read this from the Daily Wire. Pro-lifer facing over a decade in prison says he's ready to go head-to-head with the Biden administration. Paul Vaughn, one of the six pro-lifers facing over a decade in prison over a peaceful protest, told the Daily Wire on Friday that he was ready to go toe-to-toe with the Biden administration after his conviction of two charges related to the FACE Act on Tuesday. All right, let me just say, here's what's going on. These pro-lifers went and they stood in the way of this abortion clinic. I'm not even going to talk about whether that's lawful or not, because that, that's not even the point. The point is this. We are living in the arbitrary dictates of a totalitarian regime. Christian leaders should be speaking out about it, not because they're Christian nationalists, right-wingers, but because this is an issue the Bible speaks so thoroughly on. This gets me worked up because it's such commie stuff. You can't 
You can't let people, we have this right now. My dad just texted me. My dad said that uh, pro-Palestine people have blocked the bridge from Memphis into Arkansas. There's a massive bridge there. They're just blocking it that, there. Pro-Palestinian. So these are anti-Israel protesters. that are stopping traffic. You're stopping uh, trucks from going through that are, are delivering stuff. You're talking, stopping the Amazon trucks. You're stopping people getting home to work. You're stopping who knows what else. Are they putting these people in prison for 10 years? No. Will there be any sort of uh, ramifications? No. Uh, another video went viral that I'm not going to show you right now of these four um, illegal, illegal immigrants that came over the border and they're in New York just beating up police officers. Beating up police officers. They got arrested and let out the next day with no bail. We are living in an unjust time. The arbitrary will of our dictators. We have BLM people that, that burn down cities that are not facing the kind of time that these pro-lifers are. So I don't even want to, I'm not even going to get into the, whether or not they really aren't supposed to block the entrance. I'm getting into the fact that we are not actually dealing with just weights and measurements any longer. We're, because our regime is acting like commies. They're acting like commies and the arbitrary will of, well, last night we said everybody has to be off the street by six, but we changed it to five. You see what I'm saying? We change it to five. Wait for Preston Sprinkle to do a video saying how absolutely unrighteous this is. Is he going to do it? No. Why? Because if you talk about that, it makes you a Christian nationalist. So now, you may think I'm going out on a limb about the Preston Sprinkle thing. You just heard this whole thing. We're supposed to be exiles in Babylon. I mean, except that we're not in Babylon. But, you know, whatever. Some people are going to push back. He's not really saying that. I I. I kind of do think that's what he's saying. I can, I will, I can almost guarantee you, if he, if the church he's talking about, they're talking about this kind of stuff. They're talking about evil, standing up against evil. Now, the big evil will stand up against evil as long as they kind of call it racism and white supremacy. Vaughn said, back to the article, Vaughn said that the Justice Department was attempting to intimidate pro-lifers through legal force, but that their actions had only galvanized pro-lifers around the country. Vaughn and five others faced 10 years, 10.5 years in prison and hundreds of thousands of dollars in fines after being convicted in federal court of violating the FACE Act and blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to read the rest of it. I hope that you are getting the point that I'm making. BLM people burn down cities and aren't arrested. If they are arrested and they did something super duper bad, they have way less time than this. It's okay to burn down the, 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 burn down the cities as long as you're doing it on, in the name of, of the left. If you're doing it for the right, it's going to be pretty bad. Why? Because we're under arbitrary laws. Because we have become an unjust nation, an unrighteous, wicked nation. The answer actually, I believe is to go back to the foundations of the country. <laughs> and this is the crazy thing. Christian nationalists, as they're always called, like me, I don't call myself a Christian nationalist, but people call me that. Why? Because I'm conservative. Christian nationalists like me are not saying, yeah, Trump is our savior, and we want to have authoritarian control, and, or DeSantis is his savior. Nobody's saying that. What we're saying is that the way to save this country is to go back to the principles it was founded upon. Government going back to its rightful place. Government going back to its rightful sphere where it does not infringe outside of the, the specific sphere of rule that God gave to it. To do justice. To be the sword against unrighteousness. That's what you're supposed to do, to judge people equally under the law. And that is a law that is moral. It is not arbitrary. It is moral. It is static, and it applies to rich people and poor people. It applies to men and women, to white, black, brown, anybody else. That, that is what equity actually is supposed to be. And that is the way we do it. So I know I talked about a whole ton of things inside this whole, this, whole, this whole stuff. You have to understand what the Christian left is doing. They are moving from their last campaign, which was critical race theory, systemic racism. Trump is a racist. It's a white supremacist country. Critical race theory, blah, 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 blah. 
now, because that is losing its ground, they're moving s- seamlessly into Christian nationalism. You don't want separation of church and state. You want to, to be a Christian nation, meaning that if you're not a Christian, that you can be put in prison and blah, blah, blah. They're moving fully into this Christian nationalism thing. And the same big heave of people who stomped for Biden last time, the same big heave of people who were out there saying, we are white supremacists. It is, we, we, we are, uh, you know, um, systemically racist because it really is true that, you know, there's not equality of outcomes and it's evil. The same people doing that are now in documentary films with <laughs> documentary films like God and Country saying the biggest threat is Christian nationalism. The irony being that Russell Moore and David French fr- that are in the God and Country thing saying this Christian nationalism, authoritarianism, both of those people were involved with, with the leftist deification of the state and the deification of the quote-unquote experts that tried to force everybody to get the jab. That's the irony of the situation. They are the ones who are supporting an actual idolatrous ideology. And this is the last thing I say. I don't like what they're doing. They're trying to be a false equivalence. Are there people who view Trump in an idolatrous way? Yes. But Trump's ideology is not idolatrous. His ideology says give power back to the states, limited government, individualism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's not idolatrous. <laughs> I would just call that biblical. That, that's where these ideas came from. Biblical political philosophy. So they're, they're equating this personal idolatrous saying of you just love Trump too much and you just view him as some kind of savior with the actual idolatrous ideology of the deification of the power state that wants to force you to stay home wants to force your church to close, wants to force you to get a jab, wants to force you to give your kids to the, to the state for them to educate. You're not allowed to educate your, your own kids. Who wants to forcibly take your money and redistribute it to the poor? That is not a biblical concept. So Russell Moore, David French, and all these commies out there, they support all this stuff. They're not doing it from a bibl- biblical perspective. That is a leftist socialist perspective. Because why? Because they're apolitical? No, because they are political. They're political leftists, and they are supporting an idolatrous ideology. They might not, They may not view Biden in an idolatrous personal way, in the way that a lot of people on the right may, may, I stress, view Trump. But their, their idolatry of this ideology, the ramifications of it, are far worse Far, far worse for people's lives and totalitarian control than the idolatry of Trump that exists on the right. Boom, you heard it. Go to Amazon, buy my book, Wimpy Week and Woke. Have a good week. Read the Bible.